Hey everyone, welcome back. This is Engineer Media Seriously, where we actually take a bit more of an engineering approach to some of the topics discussed on the other channel. So if you follow the link here and you have not watched that video yet, I suggest you go watch that video first to get some context around the topics we're going to be discussing today. But for those that just want a high level recap, basically in the previous video we discussed um, what the cost is about launching a cube satellite and how the percentages break up in terms of where the cost is actually allocated. So what the summary was is that 40% of a cost of a CubeSat or of an entire CubeSat project is roughly related to the actual tangible hardware. And that number as of it stands right now is anywhere from sort of 10,000 to 22,000 American dollars. Now, as a practicing engineer, I know for a fact that it cannot cost that much um, in physical components to actually build a system like this. And therefore, that's exactly what we're going to do here. We're going to dive in to see what it's actually going to take to build this sort of thing if you were to be supplying the labor yourself um, across the entire stage of building this device, as well as discussing the actual mission as to what we want to achieve with building a little device like this ourselves. So let's jump into it. One of the first things we need to sort of acknowledge and uh, account for is the fact that a lot of the components that gets bought um, for CubeSats is engineered by third-party organizations, engineering companies, and they primarily built or broken into um, little subsystems. So what you can think of is that's normally inside this box would be a PSU, which I normally call just a power supply. I know it's got a different term. You would have a CPU of some sort. You would have a um, power generation, and then you would have a payload. And the payload might be um, the actual radio or it might have a separate subsystem that would be your radio communication to and from the actual device itself. Now, generally these sort of systems, oh, and of course you will have um, attitude control. We'll discuss one of each one of these individually. Right, and most of these systems um, comes or can be bought as a separate physically engineered subunit that fits into a little slot inside your one cube satellite. And that system can be used to be integrated into the rest of the little subsystems. And what makes a CubeSat cost actually that much is the fact that if you buy that little subsystem, let's say you buy the PSU from a third party vendor, you are paying for that company's time, engineering, profits, everything that's built into that little subsystem over and above the fact that it's probably um, coats, rated high reliability parts, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you can think of it as the total CubeSat cost compiles up into a combined project by paying for everybody's little bits of profits. And the reason why this is an attractive model for a lot of companies is because a lot of the companies out there um, don't really care about any of this sort of portion of the device. All they care about is getting their specific use case and payload into space um, with a reliable system. So it makes sense for them. But for the purposes of what we are discussing, 90% of this stuff does not need that overheads nor um, the reliability probably as to what we're going to do. And it all depends on the payload, ultimately, at the end of the day, what you actually want to achieve. So I've been looking at the sort of research and um, other similar projects as to what has been done here before. And what I found was a lot of those approaches followed very closely in these footsteps, not only from a um, modular approach, but from a high reliability approach in terms of very intricate, highly detailed, highly reliable subsystems, um, redundancy, everything built in. But is that really what we're after? Um, and so that's the purpose of this video. So 
what I'm going to do is I'm quickly just going to jump in and sort of talk through each one of these things at a high level. And then we can actually look at some of the components as to what you could buy from third party vendors and what the, the cost implications are, as well as what the alternatives might look like for us as DIY builders. So let's start. Um, the first things we can look at is actually the PSU. And for my terms, a PSU is a power supply unit. Now, there's a couple of options here, especially if you want to go cheap um, or a cheaper alternative. You could go primary cell, which is just a primary charged uh, battery that cannot be reached or cannot be recharged by any means. But because it's got a different chemistry, it actually has quite a bit of energy um, for its density. So this is a 18505, 3.6 volt battery, but it's about 3000 um, milliamps. So this can carry quite a bit of energy depending on what payload you do. And you could probably fit quite a few of them in here, obviously depending on your weight um, limitations as to what you want to do. So you could go the primary route only and just have a defined battery life and be done with it. And that might sound a bit primitive, but considering the late, the um, more considering the more modern technologies, you could actually get a three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years out of these things depending on the payload. So, considering that half the the cubesats um, burn up in that time, it's really not that um, far fetched idea just to go with a primary system and and be done with it. But let's say we wanted to build a regenerative system that um, would recharge every day. So what I have here is actually a little energy harvester that has the ability from ambient light to uh, boost and charge up a 3.6 volt battery. This is a little 60 milliamp um, lithium battery that was actually dead. And in about four days, these two little solar panels that puts out about 300 millivolts was able to charge this battery back up from naught to 3.6 volts. So, I mean, you can physically see, yeah, just in, in terms of size-wise, that's the actual chip over there. And ultimately, you would lay out your own little PCB um, with all these things. And that's the sort of real estate these solar cells would take. Now, these are not A-grade solar cells. they they fairly common commercial-grade solar cells. But again, sort of looking at the actual real estate that you have on a CubeSat, you can clearly see how quickly and easy it could be to fill this thing up with a lot of B-grade solar cells um, and still get a good amount of energy out of your CubeSat being exposed to the sun. I mean, on average, a CubeSat, I think, gets about sunlight about 90 minutes, between 60 and 90 minutes per rotation around the Earth because it's in such a low Earth orbit it actually spins around the Earth 16 times a day or something like that. Please correct me if I'm wrong. But 16 times a day times between 60 and 90 minutes of sunlight, there's enough energy to actually be harvested out of um, your little cube set to keep a battery charged. Now, the second thing that needs to be discussed in terms of the PSU here is the actual battery itself. You could decide to use a lithium ion battery and you would need to look at the complexities of actually heating the battery, um, making sure that you don't charge a super cold battery because you can actually damage the battery that way. Or you could go with a more modern uh, method. And again, I, I'm still investigating and researching all of this, but there shouldn't be a reason why you can't use a super capacitor. Um, this is a 3.9 volt 5 ferrite super capacitor. And again, depending on your payload, this could carry your payload and transmissions um, multiple times a day without needing a recharge. But the nice thing about these devices are they don't need a heater, um, either a supercapacitor or actually a passive solid state um, ceramic capacitor bank, depending on, again, your size and your weight of your device. So you could get the reliability of battery way up by selecting a different technology there. So let's say that's the high level options for a, a PSU and we'll select that or we'll go through those things in future videos independently as we go through the selection. Now we get to the CPU and I see a lot of these systems um, run CPUs that is quite high powered. I mean, it's, it's a proper 
quad core processor and they run different subtasks in these processes and things. And again, depending on your payload that you want to do, that might be necessary. But quite frankly, this is a little Arduino Pro Mini. Um, it's an 8-bit processor. You don't need to go that low. You can go 32-bit um, low-power processor, 48 megahertz clock, and it'll do perfectly well what you want to do in terms of your little CubeSat, again, depending on the payload. It doesn't need to be a a high-end, high-reliability device. Um, so that's pretty much all I have to say about the the little CPU because we'll touch on it just now again when we get to the radio itself. But this device has been used for this sort of applications in the past and it has proven to be somewhat reliable, especially at the sort of entry-level um, project we're discussing right now. So we'll call that done for the CPU for now. We'll discuss this later and as well go into Raspberry Pis. And then one of the next biggest stumbling blocks I see when it comes to the CubeSat satellites is actually the radio communication. Um, so what is referred to as the radio is the actual device that you use to communicate to and from the Cube satellite. Now, a lot of people opt for X-band radios um, or some proprietary radio communication, either through another satellite um, constellation like Iradium or any of those things, or they just go straight out for um, one of these little CC1101 transmitters with a front-end amplifier, and then they have to build a sort of ground station to receive the signals from this device. But quite frankly, there's no need, um, especially at the sort of level that we are interested in. This is a little LoRa module that has a transceiver built in, and the nice thing about this little transceiver is the SX1262, which is a transceiver with a PA front end, um, and it can be programmed to do 150, 433, 470, um, 868, and 915 megahertz, depending on the frequency that you want. Now, for reasons we'll discuss in a, in a future video, all you need to know is for now, we'll use 433 um, megahertz for this radio. And this is not new. Um, there's already systems that's out there that uses the exact same chip to communicate back to Earth. And the spoiler, you don't need any ground equipment. The equipment already exists. Um, there's an entire community called Tiny um, GS, I think, which is dedicated little base stations around the world that tracks 433 megahertz LoRaWAN, or sorry, LoRa um, satellites. So you can build your device, you can get your, your telemetry through that way, and you don't need to worry about building any ground station equipment. So this little device is available, it's cheap as chips, and for the purposes of what we're doing, depending on the payload, obviously, this will do for us for a radio. And then you get to telemetry. Now, telemetry, again, depending on the payload, but there is a um, accelerometer from S STM um, Electronics, Cheapest chips, little device, you can buy them in various grades of, of uh, reliabilities, various grades of temperature fluctuations. You can go, go for broke. Temperature sensor, this is actually a SHT 40 humidity and temperature sensor. It's a high reliability part. And again, you can pick what you want. Now, obviously this will always be used on your own little custom BCB. You don't have to do it this way. And then last is a little GPS device. Now, this is a three constellation or multi constellation tracking little GPS. Um, Sony makes this little specific transceiver and it can track at 10 hertz at like 8 milliamps continuous, which is extremely low for what it does. And you don't need to leave it on all the time. So you can quickly see that the sort of components and stuff we're looking at here is not high cost items. They might not be the most reliable, but they're definitely not the most expensive either. I think if I put all this stuff together, it's probably 300 bucks, 400 bucks um, at the max. Now, obviously that's excluding the frame and any sort of um, supporting structures. But where I actually want to start the series and this project is not with any of the electronics. Because to me, 
the best system is no system. So there is other subsystems it, that is required to support and deploy an actual CubeSat successfully. And one of those items is called the magnetic uh, talker. And what that does is if you have access in any orientation, um, a magnetic talker actually allows you to, in space, change the orientation of this device or what they call detumbling um, as going through space. And the quick way of thinking about it is everybody knows how a magnet works, coil and an iron core. And effectively, if you pass a current through this, you can push the satellite in orbit against the Earth max, the Earth's magnetic um, field to orientate itself. And so there's these sort of um, electromechanical systems required to actually support the system. Another one is the antenna system. So at 433 megahertz, your mega, your um, wavelength is like 16 centimeters or one half wavelength. So you can't have a 16 centimeter piece of metal sticking out this device when you do the deployment. So you have to have some sort of reliable way of after deployment, opening up the antenna. Again, that's a system that you can buy. Um, I'll show you some links. It's a system you can buy but it costs thousands of dollars or euros to buy that system because it's been flight tested and because it comes from a third party. We'll be looking at other systems like that to try and, and see what we can do to bring the cost down and if we need them in the first place. So that's where I would like to start. I'd like to see how many systems we can eliminate, what can be done if the system can't be eliminated to make it more efficient. And only after we've gone through those sort of hurdles can we actually put it down a power budget to the side? What we need in terms of a recharging circuit, a capacity circuit, and what payload we can possibly support within this frame itself. I mean, one of the, the early thoughts or methodologies I have around a CubeSat is the fact that you might not be able to build the most reliable CubeSat in the price budget you're looking at, but you might be able to build multiple little ones and have a higher rate of success by just deploying more than one unit. And what I mean by that is, if you look at this board, for instance, let's say that is our entire CubeSat. You have a radio on here, you have your telemetry on here, you have a battery or super cap at the back, and there's a solar panel stuck on both sides of a little piece of wire sticking out of it, and that's your antenna. You could probably fit three or four of these boards inside a CubeSat frame if you could find a way of reliably releasing it um, into space. You wouldn't care about this device tumbling or doing anything because it's it, it doesn't doesn't phase it much. So we'll discuss that sort of thing. We'll investigate that because maybe the way to get a reliable unit in space is just by releasing three or four of these little ones and maybe three survive, maybe one survives, at least your probability of success goes up by using cheaper parts but releasing multiples of them. So that's the scope of this project. I hope you'll follow me. If you like anything you see, if you want to correct me about anything, please hit a like, hit a comment, and consider subscribing. I will see you next time for the first actual video.